everyone. Um, I'm Shiva. I work for the uh, personalization infrastructure team in Netflix. Um, I'll be talking about a domain-specific language that we built using Scala for machine learning training set stratification. As all of you are probably aware, the Netflix homepage is a highly personalized experience for each user. Uh, the ordering of videos from left to right in each row is personalized for you, and so is the ordering of rows um, uh, which appear in a vertical manner. Um, recently, we also released a feature that personalizes the thumbnails that we show for each user. Uh, two different people being surfaced the same video can have completely different thumbnails de depending on their interests that Netflix has learned over a period of time. Over 80% of what our members watch comes from all these recommendations. Um, and these recommendations are underpinned by state-of-the-art machine learning algorithms uh, that we periodically train. We continuously iterate um, on the uh, machine learning algorithms and the data that's being fed into them and feature engineering and so on. Um, and what helps us in doing that efficiently is uh, we use historical data that's captured by our snapshots infrastructure, which I'll allude to a little later, um, which enables us to rewind back to any arbitrary point in time and rerun those algorithms and probably a better algorithm to see if we could have done better with a slightly different tweaked algorithm. And that enables us to uh, identify the efficiency of an algorithm which, uh, without actually going to production or even doing A-B tests, uh, which could be a long-running process. And after we have promising results from an offline experiment, uh, we are then ready to go to A-B tests. Uh, and we run A-B tests for a while. Netflix is an extremely data-driven company. And based on the results of these A-B tests, then we go to the general production. So here's a simplified view of um, how a pipeline looks for a machine learning engineer. Um, you start with a hypothesis. Uh, you run an offline experiment based on the hypothesis. You gather all the data for it. Uh, you model the experiment. Then you analyze the results. And typically, this tends to be an iterative process, which goes on for a while. And depending on how the offline metrics look like, uh, then uh, we go to an A-B test. And if the A-B test succeeds, then we productize the algorithm. When ex experimenting offline during the iteration process, we want to do it quite quickly. And when we go to production, uh, we would like to use the same type of code, and we'd like to have great code throughout the pipeline. And for that, Scala is a wonderful fit for us. It, it is, in fact, our de facto choice uh, for, for our machine learning code. And Scala is our sweet spot, really, because it matches a lot of the criteria that we look for. Uh, it's type safe, which means um, you know, uh, a developer is bound to make, uh, introduce fewer bugs. Uh, it's clean, functional, uh, immutable data structures allows for higher productivity. Um, unlike some interpretive languages, it's compiled into bytecodes and it's fast, which leads to better performance. And uh, quite crucially for us, it runs in a JVM, which means it's compatible with our online services. And most of our online services are Java-based. And last but not the least, um, Scala is the first, first class citizen in Spark. And we are heavy users of Spark for all our offline machine learning jobs. So earlier, I showed a simplified view of the uh, pipeline in a linear fashion. Uh, it's a little more complicated than that. So let's zoom into that a little bit. Uh, we have a snapshot infrastructure, uh, which is uh, managed by our team, uh, which runs a sequence of jobs um, um, uh, once a day. Uh, we stratify uh, what's called a set of user segments or user cohorts. Um, we collect a bunch of these different user sets. And then we go ahead and capture raw data for them, uh, often referred to as facts. And when there is a new experiment that needs to be worked on by the machine learning engineer, uh, typically the cycle, uh, it's an iterative process. It starts with the design of the experiment. Uh, and then the experiment needs its own labeled data set. Uh, and from the label data set, you stratify an appropriate training set uh, that's um, uh, valid for the model. And then the fa facts that we captured from the snapshot infrastructure are fed in as raw data, and we generate features out of them. Then you train a model. Uh, then you compute uh, validation metrics on it. Then you test the model. Uh, and if the offline metrics can be further improved, uh, you keep doing this in an iterative fashion until the until 
the model is deemed enough to go to A-B test, at which point uh, we allocate it an A-B test, and hopefully at the end of it, uh, the A-B test wins and we go to production. Um, most all, uh, as you can see here, uh, the snapshot infrastructure and the offline experiment is all uh, mostly running in Spark. So in this talk, I'll be focusing on the highlighted boxes here, uh, the stratification pieces, which sees its application both in the snapshot infrastructure as well as uh, when um, stratifying the training set for our machine learning models. So why do we need stratification? Um, it's for the snapshots infrastructure, it's required to place constraints on what type of users we snapshot, uh, while at the same time we have to ensure that we get the maximum yield when we join it with the label data set to produce the training set. Uh, we do not snapshot all the users at this point, so uh, stratifying it intelligently based on user ad attributes is an important requirement for us. Uh, stratification is also required just before the model is trained to select the training data appropriately. Uh, if we were to randomly select uh, training data, then we, uh, some of the important demographics that we care about may be underrepresented. Under -represented. Uh, you know, we are often interested in um, small countries, emerging markets, and new users, and we would like our model to adapt uh, faster and better to behavior from those select demographics. Um, so the certification library that we built uh, is a domain-specific language, which is meant to be used in the Scala and Spark ecosystem. And it places uh, quite a bit emphasis on the type safety uh, nature of it. Um, it uh, contains an expressive API uh, with which our developers can build arbitrary user sets on demand. Uh, typically, most of our use cases have been, we have been able to translate them into queries using our library. Um, we use a lot. We use a bunch of uh, user attributes uh, that are present in the query that people can stratify by. Uh, you, you know, you can stratify based on the user's country, based on the number of place um, we have seen for the particular user. Let's say in the last week, number of searches, number of devices that are registered for the user, uh, the, mem the membership tenure, uh, and we support a lot more. So as I mentioned, uh, we have a domain-specific language. So I'll be talking about, I'll be showing some examples of the building blocks that are used to um, build the queries that are part of the DSL. So uh, country is a case class. And within that, uh, there is a specific uh, object called country.us. So that represents all the, uh, a part of the universe of all our users who are uh, from US. So in a Venn diagram, you can imagine this as a circle, which are all US users. Um, Tenure.m1 refers to all users who are in the first one month of membership. And that's, uh, uh, and, you know, it overlaps with the user. So in the Venn diagram space, you can visualize it like that. Um, and you can use these building blocks to uh, build further, uh, uh, you can carve out more um, user cohorts. For example, uh, you can combine tenure.m1 uh, with an or condition on place 1, 10 that indicates all users who have had number of place between 1 to 10 in the last day. So you can mix and match like this with, and we support all the uh, Boolean operations for it. Uh, here's another example. All users who are not from US, but have had, at, and also have had at least two devices registered on them. Um, so really, uh, using this DSL, um, um, a developer can construct whatever user cohort they, have, they, they want, and then they can build a training set out of it. So um, using, um, using the building blocks, um, you can, uh, you can uh, form queries where for, for, each of the, um, uh, for each of the building blocks, you can specify a certain target count uh, that you want in the result stratified set. So in this example, I'm, sh I'm showing that using our API, you can say, uh, that you know, starting from the universe of all the users, uh, give me a subset where the number of US users uh, is about 5,000. Um, the number of users who are within the first membership, first month of membership is about 1,000. I'm showing purely hypothetical numbers here. None of this is what we really do. Uh, I'm not at a liberty to talk about our exact stratification scheme, so uh, take this um, as synthetic data. Um, so you can build queries like this. Uh, so uh, it takes in a map where the key is, is the building block, uh, and the value is, in this case, is, is, a, target, is a target count. And we apply the, these rules on our universal data set, and uh, 
Uh, at the end of it, it produces a Spark data frame uh, that contains um, uh, all, the, all the users that match the criteria. So often, target count doesn't satisfy all our use cases. Um, so we typically tend to use percentage. So you can specify it as a percentage. Uh, and at this point, what the developer is really looking for is give me the maximum use, give me the maximum um, result data frame that matches this percentage criteria. Right? Uh, on top of it, they might downsample it to a smaller size. Um, and the DSL, uh, our implementation figures out uh, uh, runs, runs a constraint solver that tries to match all these rules and tries to figure out the biggest possible uh, result data frame that matches all these rules. So uh, we use target percentage, min percentage, oops, uh, and max percentage, and you can, you can specify some of the criteria that way. Uh, this is an example where uh, uh, the DSL can be a bit more convenient, uh, where um, the user can specify, for example, country.each as one of the building blocks. Uh, and what the implementation does internally is it enumerates all the possible countries uh, and expands the second rule into, explodes the second rule into all possible combinations of it. So country.each and place one will be automatically expanded to each, each of those countries and place, and place one. And we'll try to satisfy the rule that all of these, uh, all of these individual um, building blocks here um, have a max percent of 0.2. So all of this is automatically taken care uh, by the stratification library. Um, so what tends to happen is, as the rules become more and more strict, and you're asking for a specific percentage for each of those rules, sometimes you may not get the actual number of, uh, of users in the result data frame, because as the rules become more and more stringent, you're trying to fit uh, a different distribution to a slightly altered distribution. So you may not get the yield that you're looking for. Uh, and we have an extra parameter called allowed error margin that allows you to stray away from that goal by a certain percentage. And what that tends to do is increase the yield for us. And we sometimes play around with this parameter. Um, um, so uh, we also have a convenient way to refer to uh, a distribution that exists in a, in a different data set. Um, it's, it's not. Uh, it, sometimes the developer is not clear about the exact percentage that they're looking for each rule. Uh, so they might refer to a distribution that exists in a slightly different data set. So, um, so we have a parameter called reference, where you can pass in uh, a, a, a different data frame, and then the stratification library will calculate uh, statistics on it, and then replace all the target percent dot refer uh, by the corresponding percentage that exists in the, in the other data frame. Uh, and we have several other examples, and the DSL is continuing to expand. So uh, the, in, in general, the, country, the constraint solver, um, uh, especially when percentages are involved and if the rules over, overlap, uh, it's a non-trivial optimization problem. Uh, and there's no closed form expression by which we can solve it. So we formulated it as a linear programming problem. Uh, it's actually an integer programming problem, but in our, in our experience, we found that mapping it to linear programming gives us an optimal, so close to an optimal solution. Um, and uh, we used a third party Scala library called uh, Optimus. Uh, and I just want to provide a shout out to them. Um, so the API um, in the third party pack package was pretty idiomatic and with just a few lines of code, we were able to formulate uh, all the equations that we had in paper, and we, we were able to translate that into code. Uh, so this is a code snippet uh, of how the linear programming problem was formulated. So uh, the domain-specific language uh, that I was talking about um, is currently being used for our user sets, uh, which are essentially all the, uh, you know, we store it as a Spark data frame where each row corresponds to a, to a user and a specific set of attributes for the user. Uh, but it's possible to extend the constraint solver that we have to any generalized Spark data frame. For example, if you have a data frame that has three columns, um, column foo, bar, and um, kyox, uh, you can extend um, Spark data frame using an implicit method and provide all the rules uh, that I previously showed uh, in this manner. For example, uh, you can select an arbitrary column 
and you can apply very similar rules that you know I had showed to you earlier. And this is quite generalizable, and uh, we are thinking of open sourcing this so that um, you know every, everyone else can start using this. Uh, and the DSL, uh, we are also porting the DSL to start to be built on top of this generalized framework, so we can you know support it better and identify bugs much earlier. Okay, so um, let me quickly switch over to Zeppelin Notebook. Um, is the font okay? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. So yeah, I, I just want to say here that um, this data is completely synthetic, once again. Don't read much into it. Uh, in fact, it's fake, and I randomly generated it. Uh, so here's an input data frame. Um, and uh, assume that it has four different columns. Um, and uh, so what I'm doing here is uh, this is an example of how a general uh, sampling rules on a generalized data frame would look like. Um, uh, I'm using a pretty strongly typed, non-idiomatic way of expressing the sampling rules. Uh, but we are we are uh, we also have an idiomatic version of it, which we are improving and will open source open sources soon. Uh, so, uh, for example, the couple of rules here say that uh, say that uh, from the input data frame, make sure that all the all the users from country US uh, in the result data frame is about 30% of it. Uh, people who are not in the country US are 70% of it. So the input data frame might have a different distribution, uh, and when this query is run. It invokes the uh, linear programming uh, library that I was talking about. Uh, and the logo that you see is from them. And I haven't been able to suppress it. So it's actually um, promotion for them, I guess. Um, and as you can see, the constraints are being solved. Uh, we started off with about 1.6 million rows. And after stratification, we ended up with 1.26 million. Um, we started off with a different percentage distribution of the two uh, uh, Venn diagrams. Uh, we asked for a target percentage of 70, 30, and we mostly met it with a very small error margin. Um, and I have a bunch of other queries in this notebook, uh, which I can probably show you offline, um, that um, runs more complicated queries with you know, different and, or, and not conditions. So cool. Um, so just going back. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, Netflix is hiring. My team is. Looking for candidates. Uh, I have my manager sitting there if you want to talk to him. So yeah, reach out to us on Twitter if you're interested. Any questions? I'm, I'm not at a liberty to talk about all the metadata that we use, um, but uh, some of the examples that I showed is very close to what we use. OK, um, so if it's possible to construct the more complex metadata out of the individual building blocks, then our API supports it. But um, uh, I'm not sure about the weighted vector stuff that you're talking about. Maybe you can take that offline. Yeah. Um, what's the performance of this like? So like, is it interactive kind of speed that you can change the, uh, change the parameters and kind of get back a sample size? Yeah, it's, it's quite interactive. Uh, as you can see, this query took about 27 seconds. Um, and uh, if the, it, it really depends on the data size and how much resources you have given to the cluster. Um, so yeah, it, it, is, it runs easily in a notebook, and you can tweak the queries quite easily. Uh, is, is all your data demortalized? Um, and you're running it on top of that? Or sorry, yeah. Do you have data and different data that you join that? Or 
Yes, yeah. Um, the open source contribution that we are thinking of currently will be based off of a completely denormalized uh, data frame, uh, at least the initial version of it. All right, thank you.